Do not yet let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, I want to talk about heaven. Actually, specifically, I want to start out talking about our images of heaven and where they do and do not come from. As far as I can tell, whether it is the Sistine Chapel or Tom and Jerry, there is an image of what heaven is like. It is uh, uh, full of clouds because it's in the sky. Not sky as in like metaphysical sky, but like literally like it goes, you know, hell down below, the firmament here, and in the sky is heaven, as if this is the structure of reality. And so all these scriptures about going up, okay, quite literally you're going up into the sky to a place with clouds. Um, there is a check-in desk um, with some sort of pearly gates. Right? And it is manned by St. Peter. Where is that in Scripture? Still don't know. Doesn't matter. It's consistent, right? Um, you, you, there are these gates. Um, then you see God, and the image of God is also consistent. Lee, not anywhere in Scripture. Um, as an old man uh, with a long white beard and maybe long white hair. And this, again, this is whether it is, you know, uh, mid century American cartoons or 16th century Italian Renaissance art. We are consistent. Clouds, cherubs, harps, gates, old man with long beard, right? This is consistently from Greek mythology. It is not in the Bible. Uh, what we are describing is Mount Olympus. Um, the man with the long beard is the Titan King Kronos. And the uh, Renaissance artists were weirdly obsessed with Greco-Roman mythology. And so that was their pop culture. And they created an analogy for heaven that heaven is what if you got to go to Mount Olympus. And it's not what the Bible describes heaven as. It is merely what these re Renaissance artists, again, whose pop culture, like modern pop cultures, Star Wars and comic books, um, you know, 1950s pop culture was the Old West, right? Their pop culture was Hercules and Theseus and Pericles and Zeus and all these guys, right? That was their pop culture, and so they made a pop culture image of what they thought about heaven. Because they needed an analogy, because scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about heaven. We're going to read today two of the main descriptions of it. We've already read one, didn't give you a lot of data. We're going to read a, a sec selections from Revelation 21 and 22 at the end of the sermon and give you a little more data. But I'll tell you, no clouds, no cherubs. Angels are not cute in the Bible. They're terrifying, right? God is not, does not look like Kronos. To gaze directly upon God, you apparently burn up. Read a lot of Exodus, right? They took an analogy. But it was an analogy with an important theological difference. In Greco-Roman mythology, mortals did not get to go to Mount Olympus. It was merely the home of the gods. And so by portraying Christ as a bridge to lead us to the 
cloud palace is to say that in Christianity, what we believe is that the best place, the place of heaven, the place of pure comfort and joy that they portray as Mount Olympus is for all of us, not just for the gods who pick on us. Right? There is actually something important being expressed of this idea that we get to go to the Cloud Palace. We just shouldn't confuse the fact that nowhere in the Bible is heaven described as the Cloud Palace. That's still Mount Olympus. They're not doing anything sacrilegious. They're just using their pop culture. They're just using how they, the reference, cultural references that they understand to try and tell us something about God in the same way that Jesus uses farming analogies circa, you know, what, you know, 32 AD, right? He knows he's talking, especially as he's traveling um, through the Judean and Galilean countryside. He is talking to farmers or people directly connected to agriculture. And so, okay, so imagine you're sowing seeds and this falls on this type of ground and this falls on this type of ground. The kingdom of God is not literally a seed, right? It's the spiritual content that enters our souls, but it's like a seed. And heaven is not literally Mount Olympus, but it's like, what if you got to go to Mount Olympus? What if the best place the place closest to God, was not reserved for this small cadre of gods and godlike figures, but was for everybody. Hello. Oh, cute puppy. Um, Is reserved not for some small celestial group, but for any who want to commit their life to God. That is definitely what we believe about heaven, even if the imagery is uh, borrowed from somebody else. It's the same thing about mansions over hilltops, right? This thing in the, the, the word, the Greek word in John 14 is not mansion, does not translate well to mansion. They didn't have like a great word for mansion, but it's not like villa, right? Like it's not some grand place. It's just dwelling. It's just a place to live, right? But to the mind of the frontier Christian, who is living a hard scrabble life in a clapboard house in some dusty corner of West Virginia, Oklahoma. Well, take your pick, right? The American frontier was vast where this music comes from. What they imagine is a mansion just over the hilltop. And the streets of gold comes from Revelations, but the idea of a mansion over a hilltop is not a good translation of John 14, but is a wonderful projection of what they could imagine would be great about heaven. It's comfort, it's peace, it's security, and we definitely believe that, even if the imagery comes from what they remember or have a cultural memory of what exists back in the East Coast, where the rich people lived in these big mountains on a hilltop. But it still says, what if that mansion on a hilltop, which in this life you didn't get to live in, you do get in your heavenly home because God gives you the best place. Always we come back to, however your pop culture, however your culture understands it, we always are thinking about heaven, is that God reserved the best place for us, anyone who wants to believe, anyone who wants to tie their life to God because Christ made a way for us, we get to go to the best place. Do I really know what the best place looks like? No, the biblical data gives us not a lot, but I do know that everyone who seems to want to talk about heaven from the Bible forward wants to tell you God reserved the best place for you, not just some weird group of special people whether they be gods, in quotes, or demigods, or rich people, or whatever, right? Or Tom and Jerry. There's definitely, look, we didn't get a lot of great, we didn't get a lot of modern cartoons when I lived in Europe, but we definitely got all the Hanna-Barbera reruns, and so I definitely have seen the entire run of Tom and Jerry, and there is definitely an episode where Jerry, where Tom and Jerry go to heaven, but I only think one of them gets in and I forget who it is. Other than I think I remember the mouse eating on a cloud. Anyways, doesn't matter. Or it does, but it doesn't. matters to me, darn it. So we look, I want to talk a little bit about what Jesus is actually saying here in John 14. This is actually borrowed from Dr. Sandra Richter. Does a wonderful job of describing this in the first lesson of Epic of Eden about how a Jewish, what is a Jewish father's house? What is a father's house? 
If in a father's house there are many dwelling places, it is definitely not, you know, half an acre in the suburbs uh, where your, your mother, father, and their 2.2 children live. That is not a father's house circa, you know, 32 AD. It is a family farming compound. The word compound in religious circles gets really itchy, but we're going to use that term because it's what it is, right? It's a, it is a walled in, walled in area called a bet of, in Hebrew, where there would have been a number of dwelling places. One for the eldest male um, and his wife, that would have been the, the person who ran the household, that is the father. Even if they are not the biological father of all the people, under their care, they are the person who is in charge, who has care for protecting the people, providing for the people, and setting direction for the family. They run the bet of, that is the father. And the other dwellings would live, the households of the, you know, the nuclear families, the adult male children. So I have, my father is living, he's not here today, but he's usually here, right? So he would be the one who would have run the bet of, and then me and my brother, um, and our families would live in separate houses, within separate physical dwellings um, within the larger bet of, within the larger family compound. If I, when my daughter became of age, she would leave my house. You start, you start to understand all these things you hear in the Bible, right? She would leave the bet of of my father, or if I was old enough by then, my bet of, and she would go to her husband, and now she would be under the care of her husband or her husband's father. This is not advice for modern dating. This is merely a description of first century Jewish housing policies, okay? So this is where, you know, you the line in Genesis where, you know, you leave your father's house, and, right? This is the whole thing. And so when we say, in my father's house there are many dwelling places, what we are saying is that the kingdom of God is like a giant, an imaginably huge family farming compound where God is the leader, the father, maybe not biologically, but the leader of this bed of. And there's room for everybody in this bed of. Everyone can have their own dwelling where they would have their family and they would have their farm animals and it would all work together. In my father's house, in my father's bed of, in my father's compound, there are plenty of room for everybody. And the person running this bed of will never fail you, will never let you down because the person running this bed of is God. So the person protecting you is God. The person providing for you is God. The person setting direction for this family is God. Yeah? Yeah. Go see mama. That is what we mean when we say in my father's house there are many dwelling places. It is not that we're all getting crammed into some t horrifically huge suburban home or even a mansion over the hilltop. We all have plenty of space. You're all going to still get to live in your own little family dwelling. If you don't want to see the broader family, you still don't have to, right? You have a little bit of privacy, a little bit of not privacy, right? But the point is, is that we call God Father. When we say that in my father's house there are many dwelling places, it is that God will welcome us into this giant family compound that we call the kingdom of God and be our protector, be our provider, and be our guide. And Christ, in living the way he did, in dying the way he does, goes and prepares a place for us in the bet of, in the family farm, in the kingdom of God. That is what's happening in John chapter 14. It is not a description of physical heaven. Unless your heaven happens to be a first century Jewish farm. Not mine, I'll be honest. But it is an analogy connected to what they would have understood. They would have known the bet of. They might have even, some of them would have even grown up on one. Not all of them. Some of them were city dwellers. Uh, fishermen lived different lives. But they all would know, in the same way that I can describe to you, a, you know, an 1890s farmstead, even if I never lived on one, right? They would know what that would mean. And it's important for us to understand. And then, in the end, what that scripture is really interested in, what John chapter 14 is really, oh, thank you very much, very pretty. Um, what the scripture is really interested in is what, how we get there. How do we get to be a part of this family farm? How do we get this dwelling in the bet of of God? And that is, Christ goes and prepares a place for us. We connect our lives to Christ, and now we are a part of that family. Thomas and Philip ask important clarifying questions, but it keeps coming back to you, Thomas, Philip, you know me. Therefore, you know God. Therefore, 
you have a place in this family. Therefore, you receive the protection of God, the provision of God, the guidance of God. At its core, that is what it means to dwell in the Father's house. That God, because of what Christ did, we attach ourselves to God, and in God we find protection and provision and guidance from the Father, leader, person, entity, being, who probably does not have a long beard and long hair, that's still Kronos, still Kronos. I get the point they're trying to make. Still an image of Kronos. But spiritually, that's what it means. That even if we, you know, we have some folks who have had near-death experiences and come back and say, well, uh, God, it, the heaven is this way. I was in a verdant field, and there was my grandfather, and there was my grandmother, and there was my dearly departed spouse, and there was the child that I lost, right? And, and, and so certainly that is another useful image. I don't know how that connects the broader images, but certainly there is the sense of reconnecting to the entire family of God and our entire family of God, and I think that's an important piece. But what's trying to be communicated in John chapter 14 is not mansions. It is instead protection and provision and guidance in a family of God established by what Christ is, well, in this case, this is happening last, last supper, is about to do what we know as Christ has done and is doing for us. And so if you want to feel like you belong somewhere, even if you belong nowhere else, there's always space for you in the bet of, of God. I want to close this morning with some selections from the only real description we get of any kind of heavenly future. It happens to be the last two chapters of the, of the book of Revelation. And it still doesn't describe us floating up to a cloud palace. It actually describes a cloud palace coming down to here. The New Jerusalem does come from the sky in Revelation 21, uh, but it comes from the sky to earth. It is a new heaven and a new earth. But the fundamental principles of what we are receiving are the same as inside a bed of protection, provision, and perfect guidance. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Then one of the angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. In the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God. It, it has the glory of God and the radiance like a rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations, and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the walls and city. And the, and the gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 1,500 miles its length, and its width and height are equal. 
He also measured his walls 144 cubits by human measurement, which the angel was using. The wall is built of jasper, while the city of pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall, the city, are adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third was abacate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth calcium, the seventh crystalline, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz. You get the idea. I saw no temple, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it. For anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the book, the Lamb's book of life. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life and its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the trees are, are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen.